here to celebrate Paul and Alexis and the brilliant book that they have been working so hard to launch, so titled Sustainable Marketing, the Industry's Role in a Sustainable Future. Paul and Alexis have got half a century's worth of marketing experience between them. They have worked on all three sides of the marketing sector um, and they have been working very, very hard since, <laughs> since taking our business sustainability management course in 2020. I think when we were talking previously, Paul had described um, that the marketing industry was on a trajectory to becoming a growth obsessed and automated robot, I think were your words, and <laughs> which, which I think so many of us in this room believe that absolutely cannot happen. Um, marketing is such a strategic commercial function. It sits at the intersection of business and society. It is the engine room of the economy, the sibling of economics, and if we want to transform the economy, we need to transform the marketing that is driving it. And I know so many of us in this room feel very, very passionately about that. Unfortunately, there's still a very common misconception that sustainable marketing uh, simply means selling better stuff, which is a component of what marketing, of course, needs to do. But reducing it to that definition really eclipses the level of transformation that's required by the industry and the function. So when we think about true sustainable marketing, what we're talking about is something that's far broader, far deeper, far more purpose driven. And it's about raising the necessary levels of ambition, of awareness, um, adoption and action that is needed across the economic and the socio-cultural systems. So for that to happen, there's this critical thing that needs to take place, which is that a critical mass of very courageous and creative leaders need to take the charge and lead that forwards into a reality. Um, and we're here to talk about personal journeys this evening and what brought you to, to writing this book. And the thing with the personal journeys in the context of sustainability is that they can often begin with or build up into or be bookended by this sense of discomfort and unease. And one of the things that we teach in our course is actually that that sense of discomfort and unease can be something that's actually very productive when we take note of it. Because if something doesn't feel right, it often often means that it's not right. And that sense of discomfort might be shining a light on the things that require the most urgent innovation, the biggest change, the biggest amount of collaboration. So if we can just take note of that discomfort, that's something that can really be harnessed in this context. But unfortunately, many, many people are going to need to experience that feeling, um, are going to need to go on their own personal journeys, are going to need to collide with one another in order to innovate um, and find a pathway forward and what tends to happen in those journeys is that there's usually a catalytic moment as well there's this moment where you can pin that everything changed at that moment or there's a before and after of that moment or I knew something had to be different as of that moment I can remember my moment. I'm very interested to know what so many moments in the audience might be. And I can share that Alexis's moment was witnessing a plastic chair floating in the middle of the ocean, thousands of miles along, away from the shore when you were doing something very adventurous in a sailing boat. <laughs> so to pick us up where I've left off, <laughs> what changed and what happened when you found the Business Sustainability Management course? And how did that lead you to this point in the journey of launching this fabulous book you know the, the first thing that changed was the level of knowledge we actually had and, and that that was purely down to you know cisl and the amazing content the amazing assessors the amazing tutors imparting that knowledge to us you know and i think my personal part of that journey was been that's why i'm starting on the course but then what obviously came along with that is is the cohort and the support and the, the alumni that that is part and parcel of, of joining the courses. And that that was as much a, a, a change for me as anything else. I mean, we wouldn't have met if it hadn't have been for, for that scenario. We wouldn't have been suddenly surrounded by a whole cohort of wonderful people that supported you, were empathetic to you. It can be quite isolating and lonely i'm sure you're all aware as you're trying to change organizations and things like that so you had that support you had all those brains you had all those kind of ideas floating around with you to help you move forward so i think kind of the, the education the knowledge was just the starting point um but being brought into that world and into that community um 
was really where things started to pick up and change. I think the other thing as well is that we were so appalled by the marketing industry when we went through this course as we learned more and more of the chaos it's causing to the point where we were so embarrassed to even say that we came from marketing when other people on the course asked what we did because people go, oh, you're part of the problem. And, um, and actually, we got to the end of the course and actually um, we wanted to leave the industry. We were just like, we're, we're over marketing. We just don't want to be part of it. We're actually embarrassed to be part of it. And actually, it was amazing. It was actually a professor at CISL who, when I asked, well, we both asked and we said, what should we what should we do? Um, what's our advice? And he, he said, you've got to stay in marketing, but you've just got to make sure that it becomes a force for good and, um, and, and go and set that as your new purpose. And so that's, it was just a, it's such a clear North star that you couldn't really get away from it. Once you've been told that's your, that's where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so you've, um, you've packed into this book, Everything that you guys have been absorbing, have learned, have, um, you know, have worked on with industry over the last couple of years. Uh, what are the key messages that you want your readers to take away from this book? I think, first of all, the, um, we can't take credit for most of the ideas in that book in terms of we spent two years after the CISL course actually talking to so many people and actually... Um, trying to get a sort of feel for what the landscape was out there. And uh, and there was just so many people doing, you know, pockets of just such amazingness. Um, I think what we tried to do was just pull together an overall framework that brought it all together so people could use, could go to all those different parties but work out how all the different parties fitted together as a puzzle. The first big thing to take away is probably that uh, that we need to stop the harm we need to stop harming and causing so much harm to the environment and society, but which is uh, cataclysmic in the marketing world right now. Um, if you just go into the sheer carbon footprints that come out of it, um, if we go into the wastages through the roof, um, it's uh, what, what's the figure about the amount of carbon, the amount of carbon that the event industry, the global event industry produces is more than the entire USA put together. Uh, that's just one of the stats. Um, and then you're not even going into the amount of clothes that are thrown away that have been marketed in fast fashion and end up just being thrown away, often even unused. Um, so it's just that those are just a couple of examples. So I think the, the first big thing is just we've just got to take a uh, step back look at our impacts and actually just work out where all the negative impacts are before we even start going forward. Yeah, just to build on that a little bit, I think it's easy for the marketing community to go, well, that's what my company does. I'm just in marketing. I'm just you know, driving sales. But, you know, just as the light bulb went on for us, you know, the marketing community has got to realize its complicity in that. And actually it's got to step up to that and be alert to that. So, you know, a lot of the book is lifting lid on, on the rubbish that's in the marketing world at the moment. And, you know, whether it's, the sales that are being driven, whether it's the kind of just inherent inefficiency of the only global industry that can celebrate being 1% good at things. You know, if you add up all the response rates globally across all the channels, you roughly get to about 1% of what we do, do actually has an impact. And, and we've got so laser focused on that 1% that we're actually blind to the 99%, which is wasted. You know, so, you know, that that is shocking. It, it's an also a double-edged sword, as Alexis will no doubt immediately challenge me on. Because if all of a sudden marketing got a hundred percent good in its current role, just think how much damage it would be causing. So we almost need to be thankful for that <laughs> gross inefficiency <laughs> in, in in what we do. So we've got to become our market marketers that aren't here today. I've got to become alert to that complicity, and I think that's part parcel with stop the harm is making the rest, which is part of what the book's trying to do in, in those first sections, is just lift the lid. And, and just to add on top of that, <laughs> is that, that actually how we got to that is actually not using the, the normal parameters that you use to measure marketing's effectiveness. We actually took away 
well, one of the biggest learnings from from the business sustainability management course is is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or as someone once called them, and now I love calling them the world's to do list. And um, and we actually use that as the framework to map the impacts against to work out actually where is marketing not helping contribute positively to each of the UN SDGs, and and that's when it 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 really. Um, that was a real light bulb moment, wasn't it? Just how horrific marketing is when you actually start to put a completely different lens over it. Yeah, so, you know, the, the book itself, you know, in a way that a lot of the CSL courses are, is a bit of an emotional roller coaster. You know, we're, we're not pulling any punches in the first part of the book. You know, I think um, Jonathan said, you know, it's punchy. <laughs> we want to add a few kicks and thumps in there as well with it. Um, we, we definitely kind of, don't want anybody to come out of that thinking, oh, yeah, I'm not going I'm to I'm care and do what I'm doing. I want them to, we want them to be alert to that complicity. And then, and then in terms of the, the two other key takeaways, I think the second one is that um, we talk, there is starting to be quite a lot of publicity around the sort of like environmental perspective of marketing, but the bit that's really rarely spoken about is the societal, the societal element and, and this thing called brain print, um, which basically means um, every single brand touch point that a customer has, whether it is sponsorship, whether it is imagery, whether it's copy, and the subconscious impact that that is having on the everyday person. Now, to considering that we have four to 10,000 ads served at us every single day, every individual is exposed to four to 10,000 ads on, on average. And imagine if every single ad that you're seeing, just as an example, is uh, depicting a high carbon lifestyle as, as aspirational. That's what you're starting to see as normal. That's a cultural norm. That's how powerful marketing is when you start to see the sheer scale. So when one brand says, oh, well, it's, a, you know, what can I do? Well, you think, well, you're part of the massive engine. And if you're all creating this as an aspirational lifestyle, and actually the, the worst thing about it is most of, well, 70% of the marketing today is based on inadequacy marketing. So it's basically saying, um, you know, your hair's too frizzy buy this product, you're not wearing the right shoes, buy this product, you're not, it's always telling you that you're not good enough. So we have, um, well, there's so much research out there that says the nations where there is the most advertising have the worst mental health states um, in the population, which is just horrific. Um, so it's, it's about scaling back the negative brain print and actually start using brain print and really turn it around so it becomes something that drives change just through the very nature of how you do things. Yeah, and I mean, brain print is something we're very passionate about and what we'll get on to uh, with one of our projects in a bit. But I think, you know, again, there's this acknowledging it. You know, there's lots of research in pockets around brain print, such as, you know, um, sexual equality or kind of racial bias that's put in, into different things. But there's nothing that collectively draws it all together. So it's kind of like this huge impact that's a bit hidden uh, across the industry. Um, but in the same way, blatantly obvious, you, know, you can't ram 4,000 messages down everybody's eyeballs, you know, every day of the year for decades and it not have an impact. And part of what we're trying to explore in the book is how do we unpick that? You know, we've got to take, we can't just stop it because they're there now. Those kind of like thoughts, those cultural norms are embedded. Hmm. And part of what marketing has to do in becoming aware of its impact is figure out well, what do we do? Because we, we couldn't simply just turn it off and have a positive one going forward. Because, you know, there's been that sheer weight of momentum behind the current brain print. Um, so we have to become alert. We have to start figuring out how we disassemble, unpick the current brain print and then architect an entirely new one. Yeah, which is such a huge and exciting piece of work to be Absolutely, done. Yeah. And like you say, hidden in plain sight. Sorry, the final takeaway is don't worry, it ends on a positive. <laughs> the final takeaway of the book is that we actually use the Sustainable Marketing Compass, which is our framework about how to embed sustainability into marketing. And we actually use that framework and we teach you how to use it. It's a guide. We don't give you all the answers because we don't know all the answers because every single brand is going to have different challenges. But it gives you a guide on what to look out for, how to perspective potentially go around it and what kind of questions you should be asking. And that's, I suppose, the real thing that we're trying to do. Is, is so that we can help uh, brands become a force for good. And I think, you know, just to build on that again, what what that lad is up to and the, the big idea that we're, we're 
trying to land in the book is that marketing's had a role which you know has played a very valuable role in our current economic model you know back in the 1960s the economists of the time said that you know we'll drive well-being in society by actually allowing us to buy products and services that make us feel better and over the last 60 years we've become really really good at that in the pursuit of one thing which is infinite growth and none of us are going to be in this room if we believe in infinite growth and what we realized is we did all the research and we're, we're kind of running with a kind of our, our mission from our professor was actually no matter how much you settle around the edges you're never going to change marketing unless you address that core role and that's really the core idea in the book and what we actually say is that marketing needs to abandon that mission of kind of driving for growth in, that, in all that it does and use its skills use its techniques use its capabilities to actually drive for a sustainable future for all, for people and planet. And what we propose in the book is a new mission for marketing, which is, you know, deliver, doing the optimum and optimal it can do to deliver health and well-being for people and planet. And to help people get their head around that, we actually propose three new missions for marketing. There's an environmental mission that marketers and marketing has to look to preserve nature, regenerate nature, respect nature by optimum consumption patterns and reducing production. There's a societal mission, which actually looks at treating individuals with respect and equity and helping them be prosperous in their world. And there's still a commercial target in there. There always will be, you know, we're never gonna move away from that. But does that move more towards prosperity? Does that move towards working with citizens rather than consumers in the pursuit of new economic models, whether that's donor economics or green growth or degrowth, we haven't figured that part of our sustainable transition out. But marketing needs to move to that sort of commercial prosperity agenda rather than infinite growth. And the idea behind the compass is that it allows the marketeer to always bring those three pillars to every decision point. And hopefully by doing that, we start to pivot the role, and more importantly, we start to pivot the culture of marketing. Mm -hmm. And so when you're pulling it into every decision point, you mean into the how? Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah you've, got, you've got to question everything through that lens of all three aspects. And if you might get environmental and commercial right, but if societal isn't right still, then you need to go back to the starting blocks again and, and start again and, and work at how you can get all three over the line. What is next and how can people get involved in what you're working on? So, um, yeah, well, the next big thing is as we, as we were designing the framework, um, we realised that there were just massive gaps that need to be filled if we're going to go forward. And they're gaps that we can't do by ourselves. Uh, they, they're areas that we know need to be done if we're going to move forward. And, and we basically decided that the only way we're going to do this is actually learn from other industries. And actually, we met this amazing lady who's on the board of AstraZeneca through the height of COVID, um, who was on the, the, the business and business management course with us. And uh, she just said, we have these massive problems in healthcare. She said, I, um, you know, there's things that, so uh, one example uh, that she always brings out is, you know, those tiny little paper leaflets that you get in every single antibiotic, um, full of so much information that I don't know how do I say it, most people don't read, but anyway, um, <laughs> it has all the legal things. If one word needs to change in that for a legal reason, they have to throw away the entire batch. And that is millions of products just going in just because one word change in, and from the legal perspective. And because they, they, it's cheaper for them to do that than to pull out the paper and replace it with a new one. And so that's just one example. And then another one that she pulls out all the time is that how many dispose, um, how many inhalers, because they're all disposable, are just thrown away for asthma. And 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 there are so many different pharma companies who work on who who produce these these inhalers. And she just said no one brand will take it on by themselves because it's such a big thing. So she said so she set up the secretariat called You Maker. And she said, uh, and within that, she's got this collaboration called the Sustainable Medicine Partnership. And she's brought together 45 brands, companies, NGOs, research organizations to tackle this head on um, and, and actually work out how they, they, they come to a solution that can then be open sourced and rolled out. Um, and 
we worked on the communication aspect of that project for her and we were just so nice and we were like that's what we need for marketing we need that kind of perspective we need that complete diversity of views so um we decided to launch our own version of you maker <laughs> and uh we uh yeah officially launched a day the sustainable marketing task force um and the first two big projects that are going to come out of that um that we see that came out of our research the first one is um if we're going to find out the environmental and societal impacts of marketing and we're going to work towards it we need to align ourselves with the united nations sustainable development goals because nearly every other function manages to do it and we just don't seem to do it um so we've been in touch with the un global compact and um and we are going to start uh, producing our own version. They've got a massive uh, SDG matrix for the sustainable finance world, and they've got one for the construction world. And we just said, until we start doing it for marketing, no one's really going to know what targets they need to work towards and how we're actually going to work as an industry towards helping achieve this world's to-do list. Um, so that is the first one. Yeah, yeah and, the, um, and the details of the walls on the, on the screens, by the way. Um, and then the second one comes back to back to brain print. Um, so, as you've already gathered, it's something we're very passionate about. Um, one of the things that we've been hugely impressed by in the, the sustainable marketing world, and actually one of the guys mostly responsible for it, is here in the room. Is, um, is, is Jonathan is um, is the purpose disruptors report on advertised emissions, and what that did. Jonathan can explain it far better than we will be able to. Uh, what that did is actually put a whole new metric into the industry that really raised eyeballs. And, you know, to the point where some players in the industry were potentially even trying to push back on it. But it raised brilliantly awareness around those impacts of what advertising does and started driving a whole new bunch of conversation and discussion about whether it's right, whether it's wrong, but what do we actually do about it? How do we actually manage it? And and I think that sort of game changer, that sort of model is what we need on brain print. You know, we need something that actually says, okay, here's what marketing is doing from a brain print. Here's what it's doing to society. And in places that will be good and in places that will be very, very bad. But at the moment, there's no overarching framework that ties all that together. So, you know, and, and there were some other problems as well. It's kind of like, how do you actually measure that? You know, because this is measuring all the, the media and all the creative and all the messaging that's going out in the world. That's a huge, huge task. It's looking like AI is beginning to offer solutions to be able to measure that. There was, there was a great bit of work done by um, the University of Singapore where they took all the creative work from the, the Cannes Ad Festival and and they interrogated and said, you know, that ad's got a smile, that ad's got a frown, that ad's got blah, 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 blah in it. Then they trained some AI on it so the AI can look at other creatives and actually say, okay, so that's a happy ad, that's a sad ad. That gets really interesting. It means there's technology that can go out and interrogate the brain print but we don't have a common framework for, framework for saying, what are we interrogating? So the, the task force we're, we're launching is one to bring as many people together around actually defining and setting a kind of measurement criteria for that brain print. So then, other, very much like we're seeing in the carbon calculator world at the moment, Every agency and his dog has got their own version of a carbon calculator. And we know that there's clients out there that are actually coming to us and saying, is there the Lord of the Rings carbon calculator that can bind them all and can control them all? And it's like, no, there isn't. You know, and actually, you can't put them side by side. You can't benchmark them. They're always using, all using different methodologies. If we're going to enable the marketing world to measure brain print, wouldn't it be great? if it was all against a consistent framework that allowed that in comparison, allowed that interoperability, allowed that benchmarking. So that's the, that's the objective of this, um, this task force, is to kind of define what that looks like. Not to then build the solution, that's up to the industry to do that, but to actually define what that actual framework should be. 
And I think just to add on to that is that, again, going back to what Paul was saying around having lots of individual carbon calculators, but no agency will tell another agency how they produce their carbon calculator. So it's really, you know, it's still seen as a competitive thing, which is just not going to move anything forward whatsoever. So like the Sustainable Marketing Compass, we really want to open source everything that comes out of this task force because that's the only way we're going to get acceleration, um, you know, and, and transition as fast as possible.